This is part 8 of the question. Here's the claim made in this part. f of n plus little o of f of n is theta of f of n. We need to either prove or disprove this. If you recall the video on using asymptotic notations in equations, you will remember that when one of the terms on the left hand side of an equation is depicted in any of the five asymptotic notations that we have seen, it means that any arbitrary function from this set can be combined with the rest of the left hand side and the result is going to be equal to what's on the right hand side. And likewise, if an asymptotic notation is used on the right hand side, we are saying that whatever function is generated by a combination of f of n and an arbitrary member of this set, that function is going to be in this set theta of f of n. It will be equal to some function in this set theta of f of n. So stating this informally, f of n plus any member of this set little o of f of n. This is equivalent to saying take any function that grows smaller than f of n, whose rate of growth is smaller than the rate of growth of f of n. Growing at a smaller rate than f of n. If you take f of n and add to it any function that grows at a rate smaller than the rate at which f of n is growing, you're going to get a resulting function. The, the resulting function is going to be, you're going to get some function that is in theta of f of n or in other words grows at the same rate as f of n. So intuitively this makes sense. If I take f of n and I take another another function that's growing at a smaller rate than f of n, I'm going to end up with f of n containing the dominant term. This function, any function I take from this set little o of f of n, is going to contribute only lower order terms because the function is growing at a rate that is smaller than the rate at which f of n is growing. So the dominant term in this sum is going to come from f of n. And if we follow that heuristic where we just ignore the or drop the lower order terms and ignore the constant coefficients, the rate of growth that we are going to get will be equal to the rate of growth of f of n. And so this resulting function is going to grow at the same rate as f of n or in other words it's going to be in theta of f of n. This is the intuition and or, or this is an informal argument. Let's try to prove it more formally. So consider any arbitrary function from this set little o of f of n. 
What do we know about g of n? We know that for all constants c greater than 0, once n is larger than some threshold n0, g of n is going to be less than or equal to or bounded from above by a constant multiple of f of n. This comes from the definition of little o of f of n and from the fact that g of n is an arbitrary function in this set of functions. Now, what happens when we take the sum of f of n and g of n? If g of n is bounded from above by a constant multiple of f of n for all constants c greater than 0, we can also say that for all c greater than 0, once n is greater than or equal to n0, some threshold, the sum of f of n plus g of n which is the left hand side of this equation is going to be less than or equal to c times f of n plus f of n. I'm just adding f of n to both sides of this inequality. What we get here is the left hand side of this equation f of n plus g of n and we need to prove or disprove that f of n plus g of n is in theta of f of n. Now to show that it's in theta of f of n we need to argue that there exist positive constants k1 and k2 some positive constants k1 and k2 such that for all n greater than or equal to some threshold f of n plus g of n is going to be sandwiched between two constant multiples of f of n because they are claimed to be in theta of f of n. So, can we prove that f of n plus g of n is going to be greater than or equal to some constant multiple of f of n? Well, that's trivial because if we just take c1 equal to 1, what do we get? f of n plus g of n must be greater than or equal to f of n. And that's trivially true. So, actually I should have written k1 and k2 here, no, c1 and c2. But let's put k1 equal to 1. Okay, we need to prove that there are two constants for which this is true. So we can pick the constants ourselves. So let's pick k1 equal to 1 so that this will trivially be true. We could have picked k1 to be some number less than 1 as well. Right? Some Any fraction of f of n is going to be less than or equal to f of n plus any other function. So let's, let's pick k1 equal to 1 here. Can we pick a k2 so that f of n plus g of n will be less than or equal to k2 times f of n? Well, this is where we need to use what we have obtained here from the information that was given to us. What we have obtained here is a claim that for all constants c greater than 0, once n is greater than or equal to n0, f of n plus g of n will be bounded from above by c plus 1 times f of n. So, this applies 
for all constants c greater than 0. Now, if, the, if, this, if this holds for all constants c greater than 0, so what happens if c was slightly above 0? This c plus 1 would be slightly above 1. Now, we have chosen k1 to be equal to 1. So clearly k2 needs to be greater than k1. So since we are at a liberty to choose any constant c greater than 0 for this to hold, f of n plus g of n to be less than or equal to c plus 1 times f of n, let's choose a suitable value of c so that c plus 1 ends up being k2. And since k1 is chosen to be 1, let's see if we can pick, let's see if we can make c plus 1 equal to 2. And we can make c plus 1 equal to 2 by choosing c equal to 1. So if this holds for all c greater than 0, it must hold for c equal to 1. So for c equal to 1, f of n plus g of n must be less than or equal to twice of f of n. So if we took k if we take k2 equal to 2, we are in effect establishing the other inequality that we need to establish in order to prove that f of n plus g of n is sandwiched between two constant multiples of f of n. We've already shown that it's lower bounded by f of n itself. And from here we can argue that it's upper bounded by twice of f of n. So f of n plus g of n is lower bounded by f of n and this applies for any n. We don't need to even wait for some threshold. We don't need to wait for n to cross some threshold. This applies for any n, for all n greater than 0, this particular inequality. As for this inequality, we can simply borrow the threshold from here. We can say that we're going to let n sub k be the same threshold that for which this inequality was true over here. Which made f of n plus g of n be upper bounded by twice of f of n once this threshold was crossed. That's the threshold we're going to choose here. So we can claim now that f of n plus g of n is less than or is less than or equal to twice of f of n and greater than or equal to f of n for all n greater than or equal to n one. And hence f of n plus g of n is in the set theta of f of n. And this applies for any function g of n that we may pick from this set. So we have proven that this conjecture is actually valid.